All right, so welcome again to our consumer decision-making training session for 2021. We're really excited to do this this morning. I'm really excited to have Holly Johnson, Carrie Helgo, and Vanessa to train you this morning. They are fantastic agents and they're very skilled at this contest and do a great job. So I'm excited they can share their knowledge with you today. And so before we get started, I just want to recognize our committee that does a really good job writing these classes, putting things together and getting the contest ready for our youth. So we have Ellen B. Ellen, Alicia Harstead, Carrie Helgo, Katie Henry, Vanessa Hoynes, Holly Johnson, Deb Lee, Sue Millinder, Christina Rittenbach, and Katie Thompson. So all those people are working hard to get classes ready for you and to get this material to our youth um, this spring. So we're excited um, for our training this morning and be sure and ask these ladies any questions that you have because I'm sure they will have your answer. Okay, Holly? All right, thank you so much, Megan, um, for that awesome introduction. And thank you everyone for being here this morning. We're super excited to talk about consumer decision-making. We're on the committee because we absolutely love it. And um, we're just gonna go ahead and get started. So what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna talk through obviously consumer decision-making, kind of help guide you um, how you can coach your team. But also at the end, we're gonna have kind of a more open discussion about how to hold a county contest. So you guys can throw questions at us, ask for tips, um, kind of whatever you need, how we can help support you in your counties doing your contest. Every county does it a little bit differently, which is what makes it really cool and unique. So we'll do our best to answer your questions. And I'm going to turn it over to Vanessa. Um, one more thing, though, um, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or interrupt us um, and we'll go ahead and get started. All right. So, of course, uh, in 4-H, we always want to talk about life skills and that it's this isn't just an event, but it, there's a reason for having students be involved and 4-H members being involved in this type of activity. Um, critical thinking, it helps kids to be able to take some facts that they know, some things that they're looking for, be able to critically go through the process of making a decision. And obviously, we start with things like, you know, choosing snacks or buying clothes but hopefully they're going to take these same skills and be able to go on and purchase a car or maybe a home. Um, the same type of critical thinking is needed for those big purchases, just like the small ones. Wise decision making, again, using those same kinds of ideas, express ideas clearly and concisely. Um, we're going to talk about how, <clears throat> excuse me, how 4-Hers will need to not only make that decision, but then also be able to articulate the reasons why. And of course, we all know that public speaking and being able to collect our thoughts with the, in front of a group or with in another individual is our skills that we use every day. Um, verbalize and defend those choices through those reasons that we give, and then also problem solving. So great opportunities for them to learn many new things. Then I'll turn it over to Carrie. Yep, I'm like, sorry, I got to close my background on you guys. I was like, lost my train of thought. So there are three different age categories that we use in consumer decision-making. Um, I'm going to start with the beginner on those ages eight to nine. So if you're doing a county contest or maybe a district contest, however you set it up, um, the beginner ages are ones where you can pretty much kind of walk them through um, and what they're doing. It's a learning piece. They are separate um, they are separate, um, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, they're studying different pieces. So like in this case for this year, for the beginners, the beginners are actually going through, um, they have pets, they have t-shirts and they have bread. Um, so they will be learning those. The beginners are um, able um, to participate at the state contest, but um, they may do that, We but we will force, uh, put the caveat on that they, this is a lot of reading that is involved in it and a lot of those decision-making pieces. So really judge your ages as you're sending some of these kids out at those younger pieces. We want this to be a very positive experience for them. We want them to learn and to be comfortable in what they're doing. So kind of know where they're at when you're judging that. So then at the state contest, normally we have the junior and senior division and those ages are 10 to 13. Um, but I do want to point out too though, they are as of September 1st and up to age 13 of December 31st. And this year would be of 2020. I have that, am I doing my numbers right, girls? 
on that. So that would be in the junior piece. The juniors and the seniors both study the same study guides. Um, this year we are, um, the categories are boots, um, dairy snacks, and portable speakers. And so then the senior ages on the senior teams, you're looking at ages 14 through 18. That same caveat, they want to be those ages as of December 31st, 2020. And the reason that what they have those, um, that date on them, because normally everything is as of September 1st, um, uh, the start of our 4-H year. But we put that on there because then that corresponds with the national ages that they can go out at that national contest that is usually held in conjunction with the national roundup out in Denver um, the first part of January of the following year. Okay, my turn. So kind of how I like to start out um, if I'm working with some new juniors or new seniors, is we really focus and start talking about standards. And you'll hear that word come up a lot throughout the rest of the presentation. But I kind of walk them through a conversation of something that they've purchased recently. Maybe did you buy a candy bar? Did you buy a shirt? Like I ask them something they've purchased because buying things is part of our daily life. And I really wanna make it relevant to them. So I ask them something <clears throat> of that nature. And then I ask them, what did they look for? And then they'll tell me something, well, I want my favorite flavor, or I want it to be in my size, or I have only so much to spend. And then I basically have them identify those are standards that they're looking for. So a standard, as the slide says, is criteria on which the class items are judged. And you find those in the situation statement. And I'll be showing you a situation statement in a little bit. And the really important thing to remember is the standards in that statement are listed in order of importance. So that's going to help you really rank your um, the items that you're comparing. Something to kind of keep in mind when you are reading a junior situation statement, there's usually three or four standards written in that story. But the seniors, they can have up to six. So there's not, it's not four every time. It's not the same number every time. It varies a little bit. And as you see, those are some examples. So dollar amount, the size, color, flavor, calories, different health um, nutrition options. So those are all different examples of standards that we're looking for when we're purchasing a product. So here is the situation statement that we're going to be walking through the remainder of the presentation. This is a relatively straightforward one that would probably be either beginner or juniors. So you're welcome to follow along with me as we go through it. And like I said, this is a story that has the standards written within it. So Douglas has $10 to buy a t-shirt. He wants a t-shirt he can wash in the washing machine. He wants to tumble dry it in the dryer and he wants it to have long sleeves. So how on earth do kids stay organized when they're looking at the situation statement and they get four products that they're looking at? How do they, how do you organize it all? Well, the next thing that we're gonna show you is this grid and I'm going to share a file in the chat Hopefully you can see it once I get it in there. It's going to have this grid and it's also going to help break down how to write your reasons. And my network is not working with me right now. So hopefully maybe we can either have someone else attach it or we can email it out afterwards. But this is the chart that the kids will write down their standards in and then they'll mark which products meet those standards. So going off of, um, Douglas's situation statement, he has $10 to spend. He, and that's the most important standard and it was listed first. So we listed at the top of our grid. Um, he wants to wash it in the washing machine. Doesn't wanna to have to hand wash it or something like that or dry clean it. He wants to wash it in the washing machine. He wants to be able to tumble dry it in the dryer and he wants it to have long sleeves. So that's how you pull those standards from your situation statement and organize them into this grid. And then um, Vanessa and Carrie are gonna walk you through four different products and we're gonna compare and contrast how they all meet or don't meet the different standards and how we place our class. All right, so here's our very first our very first shirt. You can see it's an Arizona long sleeve t-shirt. And I'm gonna have everybody help me fill in these standards. So you can see we have 
highlighted, we have number one and we have boxes below that. And so whenever uh, an item has the standard that we are looking for, we're gonna put an X in there, meaning that it meets that standard. So the very first one, $10, who can unmute themselves and tell me, does this, does this um, T-shirt meet the standard? Is Can we buy it with $10? Yes. Okay, I heard somebody very quietly say yes. So we're gonna, we're gonna put an X in that box. And who can tell me um, how much, what is the cost? And, and we already have that in there, $8.99. And we put that information in there because that will be helpful for us later on when we're giving reasons. Um, it's always important to tell um, especially the juniors and even more importantly, the seniors to put as much information within this grid as they can gather, because that will make their reasons just that much more um, informative and will give them more basis for their, for their reasons later on. Okay, next, machine washable. Okay, give me a thumbs up if this particular t-shirt is machine washable. So everybody go into reactions or, or yep, physically give me a thumbs up. Okay, I'm seeing that in there. So yes, they say it is machine washable. All right, how about tumble dry? Can I tumble dry this one? Give me a thumbs up if it's tumble dry. All right, give me a thumbs down if it's not tumble dry. Right, we don't tumble dry this. Who can unmute and tell me how do we dry this one? Line dry. Line dry. Okay, so that would be something we could put that in, in our box here. We could put line dry if we wanted to. Um, and lastly, our final one is long sleeves. Everybody, does this have long sleeves? Give me, uh, give me another thumbs up if it is. All right, I see some thumbs up. So definitely number, number one is also that has long sleeves. Okay, let's move on to our second shirt. And our second shirt, let's see, kind of take a look at it, take some time to read, read through some things there. So I'm gonna start picking on people now that I see. Okay, um, how about Sarah? Sarah, is, is this shirt within our budget of $10? No. No, right, how much does it cost? $13.99. Okay, so we're not going to put an X, but we are going to put $13.99 in there. Next, let me pick on somebody else. How about um, Shandy? Is this machine washable? Oh, I don't think your mic is working. Try again. Oh, she says, yes, it is in the chat. So we're going to put an X there for machine washable. How about tumble dry? Let me see. I saw Cindy's face earlier. Cindy, is this shirt tumble dry? Nope, it says line dry. It says line dry. Okay. And then finally, we're looking for long sleeves. And Amy, can you help me out with that? Nope, it has short sleeves. It has short sleeves. So again, we're going to leave these two boxes open. All right, so I think I'm gonna turn it over to you, Carrie. All right, so I'm gonna continue on with what Vanessa is doing and pick on you guys from the audience as it comes through. So we have a Viking shirt that we have here. So the first standard again is going to be the same. Can we purchase it for $10? So Aaron, are you out there? Yep. Can we purchase this? And how much is the t-shirt? $7.99. Okay, so we will mark that into our box that corresponds in that column three. So next, we want to know, again, with that standard, is it machine wash washable? How about Louis? Are you out there? I am, and it looks like it is. Very good. So again, the kids will check that box, put that X in, and tumble dry is third. So what about Karen? Yes, it's tumble dryable. Excellent. Hey, we're on a roll with this one. This is looking good. And then the last thing, of course, is long sleeves. So how about Rachel? Me, Rachel? Yes, Rachel, that sounds good. All right, yes, it is long sleeved. All right, so let's check that box as well. Thank you, Holly. So that one, as you'll see, we got all four checks, okay? That's perfect. Now we have one more though to look at. 
So this is our last shirt, this little Pro Spirit short sleeve t-shirt. And we go back to our first standard, always starting at the top. Can we purchase it for $10? How about um, Kim? Yes, you can, $5. Very good. So we're gonna collect that information as we go through. Um, next up, we got machine washable. How about Millie? It's hand wash. It is hand wash. So if you want to make that note in your in the box, you certainly can, or you can just leave it blank. But you know, juniors, again, like Vanessa said, they're not going to probably capture as much. But the seniors, the more information you have, um, the better off you're going to be down. The, these are your notes. Um, so tumble dry. How about Deb? It is not. It's line dry. It is line dry. So no X will go in there. And then our last piece that we have. About, um, I'm looking, what about Kendra? Kendra, does this one have long sleeves? No, it does not. Okay, so then we leave it just as that. So that finishes out our grid. We've looked at all four standards. Now, what do we do with our grid? I'm gonna turn it back to Holly. Okay, thank you guys for that awesome participation. So now we've got our grid filled out. That's half the work. <clears throat> like Vanessa said at the beginning, we have to be able to explain um, explain why we're placing things the way we are. So the first thing we need to do is create our placing. So I'm going to scroll through here and I'm going to pick on Lynette. Can you tell me what you think our placing is and just take a guess? I would pick number three first and yeah. number one second, number two and then number four. Okay, so this is a good opportunity to kind of walk through what, um, why we would place them, because we've placed them four over two, and we're going to explain why in a little bit. You're really, really close with just mixing up that bottom pair. So the placing for this class is three, one, four, two. So now how do we explain that? How do we defend that? Or if, um, if Lynette were to do this, she might write her reasons a little differently and defend it a little differently. So now we're gonna go through the process of writing our reasons. So we start by saying, I placed this class of t-shirts, 3142, and this uh, layout of how to write your reasons is also in that sheet that Megan shared. So there's the grid in there and there's this blank slate of how to structure your reasons. So you always start out by saying um, the order that you're placing them in. It's a good way to start off and just keep yourself organized. So then what you do is you go pair by pair and explain your top pair, your middle pair, your bottom pair, and then the last product. So we're gonna start by our three over one. So we just look at product three and just look at product one and say, I place three over one because. So let's see, um, Tyler, can you tell me something that three has that one doesn't have? That's how I explain it to my kids when we're writing reasons. It's really easy to say three has all of the standards and that's it. That's what kids really like to say and they're right in this case, but we want them to be specific on what three has that one doesn't have. So Tyler, if you're out there, you wanna tell me what three has that one doesn't. I place three over one because three is tumble dry and one is not. Awesome. So we're looking specifically at that one category and that's how we would say it in our reason. So we write that out or as seniors get older, they'll be able to make more shorthand um, to make their notes a little bit easier to memorize. But yep, three can be tumble dried while one cannot. Okay, now we're gonna move on to our middle pair, one over four. And we just keep going down the line. So now we look at what one has that four doesn't have. So let's see who else we've got. Uh, Max, can you tell me what one has that four does not have? Let me see. In addition to being machine washable, it also has long sleeves, which is required for the scenario. Absolutely. So one is machine washable and it has long sleeves. So you want to list both of those things out. You don't, kids again are going to want to say one has more standards then two or one then four excuse me four only has one of the standards it's really easy for them to just shorthand it but if we want to coach them to be specific so awesome job max thank you now we compare our bottom pair which is four over two so now we're going to explain why why we placed four over two 
um, and I can, I'll take this one. So we're looking at four over two, four. What four has that two does not have is its price. So um, our, our scenario, the student can afford that $5 t-shirt, but he cannot afford that $13.99 t-shirt. So that $10 standard is the most important. So that is what brings four ahead of two, if that makes sense. It met the most important standard. So that is why we would place it four over two. However, this is where we would bring a grant into play. And this is something we really encourage our seniors to do. If your juniors are comfortable throwing in grants, you wanna have them try it out, that'd be great. So this is an opportunity to look at, okay, does two have something that four doesn't? And in this case, it does. So this is where we would say, I place four over two because four costs less than $10. Granted, two is machine washable. So we're still recognizing that two's got something going for it that four doesn't, but four is still the more affordable option. And then you end it off with placing two last, and then you explain everything that's wrong with two. Um, again, kids are gonna wanna say, maybe two didn't meet any of the standards in a different example. They're gonna say it didn't meet any of them. You want them to be specific. I have to really pound that into their heads sometimes but you list everything that's wrong. So it's costing more than $10, can't be tumble dried, and it does not have long sleeves. And you just round off the class by saying, for these reasons, I place this class of shirts, three, one, four, two, thank you, having big smiles on their faces because they just got through a class of reasons. So um, I'm going to turn nope. it over. Oh, nope. go ahead. Before you go yeah. on, there is something in the chat. They're asking about grants. Does it just mm -hmm. have to be, let's see, the actual chat coming from Robin is, do you only do grants the last pair or can it be done on each pair? It can be done on each pair. This is just an example of where it was only in the last one, but you can do grants wherever you find them. That's a great question. Yep. And then they were also, yep. having, they were having fun with it in there um, and they were talking about nobody likes the Vikings. So of course that's going to be a grant that you have to take it out. So do kids' opinions ever come into play? Like I don't like purple or I don't like the Vikings, so I'm not going to check this shirt. Um, what happens because kids do they take a look at things and go no I, I really don't like that we got to remember that they are the standards that this situation is looking for not what their own opinion is no matter how much we might hate the vikings right yes right. that's really yeah. good point. and you can and I, if it helps you can have them think about you're buying a gift for a friend are you going to buy what you like or are you going to buy what your friend likes so if that helps what did you have to add vanessa I was just going to also add about the grant that the, gr gr the grant would never happen in the final when we're talking about the, the one that places last <clears throat> and the other kind of defining thing between the upper half of the reasons and that last one is that on top we're always talking about on the positive what the top one else always has that the other one doesn't and the last place when we get to that one we're talking about all the stuff it doesn't have. We totally ignore that it has anything that's of value. <laughs> we just tell them what, what it didn't have. Absolutely. Does anyone have any other questions on what we just went through? We had some great ones. Hey, this is Louie Voigt. I have a comment. Um, one thing I've always done is I have them go through and write down their placings and their pairs first because I have found if they go down and do them in order, sometimes they will write down the wrong pair. Whereas if they do it at the beginning and do it up front, then they know that they've got all their pairs listed correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and it avoids them writing out a bunch on a comparison and then going back and going, oops, I did that wrong. You know, they'll, especially the younger ones. Mm -hmm. That's a good tip. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. All right, if anyone has any other questions or tips. If not, we'll keep on rolling. Oh, I guess to kind of cap it off, the difference between a placing and those are your reasons. All right, so um, study guides. We've, we've kind of touched on this just a little bit, but to kind of explain what those are. Um, and these are the items that 4-Hers are asked or given to study 
as they begin to learn the particulars about each of the subject areas that will be judged this year. And these topic areas do change every year. Um, and so for this year, as, when, as was mentioned before, for the uh, junior and senior topics will be dairy snacks, work boots, and portable speakers. So they, they're given kind of all the facts, the things that they should be looking for, the terms that are important when, when you're um, a consumer of, of any of these products. And so that is what's included. And then also one sample class per each topic area. And that will come in um, mid-April. So they're given that to be able to study. A lot of times, um, most of the information, you know, kids will come to our, our county contest and they will find that juniors for sure will find that they can, you know, they might be able to, with a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of studying, that they can probably figure out the classes pretty easily. Um, seniors, on the other hand, we, um, we got them figured out. So when we're writing classes for seniors, we do put in some things in each of the classes, or at least a few of them, that are pieces of information that we give them kind of just enough information so they understand uh, the product, but we're not going to give them all the information. So in other words, they have to study the study guide to know, for example, if it's a nutrition piece, you know, what is considered low fat, what percentage of fat is considered low fat, for example we're going to say in the standard that we're that they're looking for low fat but we're not going to give them what what number is related to that standard so they're going to have to know that so encourage your your 4-Hers as they're preparing for both the county contest and the state contest um, especially seniors that they need to study the study guide and that um, to know some of those specific facts about whichever topic that they're looking at and then the county classes, those classes will be available in mid-May. And those are um, those will be uh, your opportunity to use two of those classes for your county contest, perhaps in, in each of the topics. And then also maybe one, um, uh, a couple classes that you can use to practice uh, both ahead of the county contest, if you wish, and then also practicing uh, for the state contest. So at the state contest, normally we have six classes for each 4-H'er to judge, two classes per topic area. And when they score those, uh, their placing scores are worth 50 points per class. So just for placing, they can earn a total of 30, uh, a total of 300, which would be a perfect score for placing all six correctly. They are given 12 minutes per class and uh, we, they are timed. And we also usually give them some warning when they're coming down to their last minute or so, so they can kind of gauge their time. Then we also have three sets of reasons. So of those six classes, for example, when we're talking about the um, boots, that, that, that being one of the topic areas. So for this year at the state contest, they will have two classes of boots they judge. One class will just be a placing class. The second class would be a placing and reasons class. So they would give three sets of oral reasons, one per topic area. And again, those sets of reasons are also worth 50 points. So um, again, a perfect score with reasons would be 150. So 450 is the total possible per participant. Now, one other addition that we have to the contest uh, we added in 2018 was the group think. And we are actually doing group think for both the juniors and the seniors this next year out at the state contest. So just kind of keeping that in mind um, that that will be something that's different. This is a team um, team process that they do. So with 4-H, we um, there was a couple of reasons that we added this in. Number one, it is part of the uh, national contest. So the kids that we're sending out um, that are representing North Dakota had to learn something new um, before they participated in that and to do that. So we thought we would better prepare them um, for that situation. But the other part about it is, is we do, you always want to include everybody um, for each is that sense of belonging and inclusion. Um, and so learning to make decisions together um, as a group and get everybody's opinion and everybody's involvement is, is, a, is a learned um, 
is a learned piece that they need to do. So the group think part is, a, again, it's a timed piece and it's a judged piece. Um, the team, which can consist of um, three to four or five members on your team, um, they have 10 minutes. Um, they are given a situation when they get into the room. Um, they do have judges that are there watching and evaluating them. Um, they will read through the situation. They can choose to read it out loud um, together as a team or read it individually. And then they will go through that. And then they will talk about the, um, the different standards that they are seeing that they're pulling out. They will talk about different solutions that they come through. Um, they will come up with um, they have their own input into which way it goes, but ultimately they have to make a decision as a team and what they want to do and then present that to the judges at the end. So um, it is not always the same as what they've been placing. Um, sometimes there are not four set things in a class. Um, it is always one of the classes that are um, or one of the topic areas that are at the state um, for that year. So it could be workbooks, it could be the dairy snacks, or it could be um, the portable speakers this year. Um, and then there is the final score. So there's 200 points per team um, that says this. So this kind of puts a whole different um, kind of spin on the standard way that we used to when we long ago called it consumer, was it consumer choices? Well, now we're actually making those decision makings. So in the group think, um, and this is broken down into one of the resources that we have on the consumer decision-making um, uh, resource in CC 616 that we'll get to in a little bit, um, you do want to state the situation. And nine times out of 10, the, the team will have worked and practiced and done. They will come up with a leader who is going to kind of um, make sure that everybody is participating, that their voice gets heard, um, and the judge knows that everyone um, is doing that. So they'll state the situation. Um, they'll read through it maybe out loud, and then they'll go through um, the standards. What are the pieces that they're looking for? And they'll look for possible solutions um, that might be in the standards, but then they also have to get creative. So um, pushing that creativity button, button, what are some of the alternatives that we can do? Um, what can we add in? What's gonna be kind of off the wall? So um, the judges are all looking for how much effort they're putting into this as well. Um, they will then evaluate each alternative based on the criteria that was put forth and that's in those standards and they are pulling those standards out. Um, chart paper is available for them so that they can write it out nice and big so they can see. Um, they can also write it individually on um, scratch paper that they have before them. But ultimately at the end, they come up with a team decision and they select the best choice for the situation. And then they will usually sum that up with their choice um, to the judges and why they did that. And then the judges will judge them on a set of criteria um, as to how the group worked together, um, some of the alternatives and the situations that they found, did they understand what was going on and whatnot and how they, um, the ultimate decision that they had. So group thinks a lot of fun to uh, work through and to plan. And it's really interesting to see some of those shire teams um, really step up to the plate and get those individuals involved um, in this process. Awesome, now we're gonna kind of move into the county contest discussion portion. This is gonna be a little bit more, less of us just talking at you and just kind of more of like a dialogue conversation. So if anyone has questions about a county contest or if Vanessa, Carrie, if you have tips you wanna start off with, I'm kind of opening up the floor. Well, I can start it out. Maybe we each can kind of talk about how we've done our contest and if there's anything different. Mine has been um, pretty traditional. It's been very similar to how we would hold a, a state contest. Um, maybe, you know, with the six classes per, per age group and, and so on. Um, maybe one addition that would be something I would uh, that I think is helpful is when you have beginners and sometimes even juniors, if they're new to consumer decision making, when they're doing their reasons, um, I usually instruct the judges that are listening to reasons to the first, the first, after their first set of reasons have been given, that they take a minute or two to give them some feedback about, you know, what they're doing well, what they need to consider if they um, are missing a piece, you know, if they're totally forgetting to talk about the last item, you know, for example, or whatever it might be, because um, I guess what I have found is that if you allow them to continue, they're just gonna do the same thing they just did 
two more times. And, and that's just, and they're losing on an out on an opportunity to practice it in a, in a, in a better way. And so giving them that opportunity to make a switch before they do the, the final two um, uh, sets of uh, sets of reasons. And then the other thing that we have done is that uh, we've had, um, we usually hold our, our contest in the afternoon and then in the morning, like I encourage kids to come in um, well, like 10 o'clock in the morning, if they want to bring a sack lunch and we practice, we go through like, kind of like what Holly just did going through a, a couple classes together as a group. And then they practice individually. Older kids usually just practice individually on some of the practice classes and kind of prepare themselves. They can ask questions. We're all just kind of working on things together in a, in a large room and then have lunch together and then move right into the contest. And that usually helps to kind of um, curb some of those nerves, that kind of thing. They've, they've gotten some practice and they feel a little bit more confident as they go into the contest. Vanessa, we have in the chat, when do you usually hold your contest? Usually, okay, usually I've held mine the first part of June. And then um, that has allowed us some time to do more practices with kids that are interested in going on to the state contest. And I would I reiterate the same thing as Vanessa. You, yours is usually the first part of June, maybe the end of May, it depends on what our council has chosen, but we kind of wait to that first part, to pretty much till they're done with school um, for us. Um, we do things very similar to the way that Vanessa does them. Um, I would say with my, I don't always hold two classes for all my juniors or my beginners. Um, with my beginners, I, the, the sheet that um, Megan put into the chat, I will have that available for them so that they have a grid that they can work off of and then they can fill in. Um, my first class and maybe my second class, depending on the number of kids I have, I will do together. You know, I mean, with the with the beginners, so that they have an understanding. Some of them might not come in with any other um, experience at all, so we'll give them kind of an easier way to uh, walk through that. I will bring in some of my um, oh, if my um, I usually have a helper, you know, here or there that can work with them or can kind of shadow them and give them some um, things. My juniors, I might only make them do five classes instead of all six, um, depending on 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 how I have them as they come through, but they pretty much kind of just roll through it the same way that the seniors would. Um, we usually, I will set up a maybe, if time allows for me, I'll set up a practice um, before the county contest and I get a few here or there. Um, one of the things that I've noticed with my kids, especially my seniors who are really busy and can't do it, they will ask for alternative times or alternative contests. So I will try to work with the, the um, my neighboring counties and find out what they're using, which situations they're using, and if we can use the same ones. And if it's the same, um, I can um, put my seniors over to their contest. Their scores do not go against their county um, one, but they, you know, um, we use their scores back here. Um, and that, and we only used to do that when there was a limit as to how many kids you could send on a team or whatnot. So we don't do that as much, but there's some different things that you can do um, that are available so the kids maybe get some prior experience if that's part of your county um, thing. But there is no um, coming into the state fair, they don't have to have participated in a county contest. You know, what I mean, you um, you just have to sign off of them at the county level that um, they will be part of your team that way. So mm -hmm. that, that's what I that's what I do. Holly. So, yeah, what you just ended with, Carrie, kind of leads into what I do. I don't actually hold a county contest out here. Um, I start practicing with them in May, um, May 1st, and then we meet every week until, until the state fair. That's how many practices my kids have expressed that they want because they really, really want to work through that group think and just have plenty of time to get through everything. So if, if the classes um, aren't available at that time, I just use old ones as long as so they get just the rhythm of how to give reasons and what to look for. And as soon as the study guides and um, sample classes and the county classes come in, we really use those for practice. Um, but you can really use anything, anything old or the new material. Um, so yeah, my kids don't really qualify per se because we don't have a county contest. I just, like um, Carrie said, sign off on them at um, our county level and they're good to go. And then don't forget to you guys, there are the combination county 
county team. So if you don't hold a contest um, or do we, you know, you can set it up so that two counties can combine to form a team, provided that there's no more than two members from the, no more than two members from the same county. So minimum of three, um, and they don't have to know each other beforehand. It, it's kind of nice that group thing throws it a little bit more. Um, I know I had a, a group I sent out um, one year and we, it was Barnes and Pemina County and they had the group thing. So we tried to do lunch together when they had a break. So they got a little bit more chance to know each other. So they were a little bit more comfortable speaking, but um, the seniors surprised you how quickly that they, you know, can, can get through that. So juniors could, can be the same, especially if it's if those that are very comfortable and talking and um, bringing others in. I make and sure I you guys some... are looking at the chat. Oops, sorry. Yeah, Vanessa, I just want to point out that Lindsay had put something in on how they run their contest and around mm -hmm. when or how that looks, if it's a workshop or whatnot. So, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, and I was just, I was just going to add to that. I, I think, you know, if you are having to put two counties together, kids from two counties, um, don't be surprised that they already do know each other. <laughs> Because a lot of our kids do do know each other. They've already networked at, at other events and things. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to add um, another another way of doing a county contest. Cass County has done this for a number of years. And I know Rita isn't on today, but she'd be happy to visit with anybody who has questions. But they've done, she's done like a come and go. And so um, it's held pretty much all day on one day. She starts, I don't know, like nine o'clock in the morning and goes to, she says you have to, the 4 h has to be there by six o'clock on that, uh, that evening. Um, that's the last person to get in kind of thing. So if you get there at 630, she's not going to let you start then. Um, but they just come and go. They don't pre-register. They go through the classes. And uh, she's also said that it's been um, fun to do that because it's been flexible with then kids other activities that they have in the summertime, whether it's summer school or sports or other things. And so kids have been able to kind of work their schedules around being able to partake. And then they've also hold, held at the same time, their clothing review contest. So kids can come, they can, you know, get their, their CDM done, and then they can also do their, their clothing review on the same day. So if you have more questions about how she does that, she's more than happy to visit with anybody about that too. And then we know yeah. last year we did the um, state contest via Zoom. So we know that that's now an option for you as well, that um, you can do that. So there's all, kinds of, uh, there's all kinds of different ways to get kids involved these days that... Yeah. Oh, and, and I think like, like Carrie mentioned too, not only um, visiting with other counties to send kids to different contests, but also working to, if you don't have a, a large number, you know, if there's a county that's close enough or it makes sense that, that uh, 4-H would travel between your two counties, holding a contest together is more fun too. You just have that many more kids involved and um, it just makes it uh, more fun and kind of dividing the work among, among two folks. Or if one person is just going to take the lead and, and lead it, um, it, it isn't really much more work to do it for 40 as it is for 20, you know, so you might as well work together if you can. And Holly, do you have, did you mention that you have your kids like make up their own? Um, no. Mary, was that Vanessa? No, that, that was, was me. <laughs> okay. So cool. You got to talk about it. Yeah. Well, um, if you have kids that are really interested in practicing a lot of times, it won't take long until um, your practice classes have been exhausted. And so unless you as an agent want to start writing a bunch of classes, um, another tip is to um, go online and pull out some different products, give uh, each 4 h -er some different products in one of the areas and ask them to write a class and bring it back for the next week. Um, this is probably better for seniors just because they have, you know, spent a lot of time with this and they really pick it up as a challenge because, of course, when they bring their class back, then their peers on their team are going to be judging their class and they get to listen to the reasons. And so, believe me, those are some of the trickiest classes I've seen written because they really want to stump their peers. So that can be a really fun um, a fun opportunity. And I will say, if you've ever written a class, 
that's the way you learn about consumer decision making is writing a class because you know the ins and outs and how to word it and um, it really helps them to know what to look for you know whether it's um, up to this amount or no more than or um, this or more uh, you know it, all those words mean different things when I'm reading that situation and those are the things that can trip can trip um, for HRs up so having them test each other is fun. I think and then one I of the <laughs> things that comes up you know, quite often on that price standard, <clears throat> people will um, say, well, what about sales tax? <laughs> Do you wanna address that? And I don't know if, we, I think we have just said that this is the cost. So we haven't necessarily said price. So hopefully that helps with that but that's probably one thing we need to make sure of um, the, the, you know, kind of in the other, other realm of that helping kids not to read into things too much to just take the facts as they're given is, is really important too. Um, and then, you know, um, along those lines, when we were going through the grid before, one thing that happens sometimes is kids will go through a, a class and they'll end up, they'll say, well, I don't know how to, how to place these because number two has the same things, you know, has the same standards as number four. And so my answer to them is, you know what that means? You either miss something or you mi or you misread something because we're not going to have two things that are exactly the same. So you got to go back. And so telling them that will help them in that case too, if they've read into something, maybe they'll go back and read it again and realize, Oh, it didn't really say that. I just assumed. I had once spoken with a coach that was coming out of um, Minnesota, and this was all pre-COVID. I don't know if you could ever do this again post-COVID, but she used to take her kids, the older ones, shopping. So they would go to a Walmart or a Target, and they were pretty much what Vanessa was saying, rather than having the homework, though, of coming back with a class. She'd send them out into the store, and they had to find four similar items, come up with a standard, bring them up to the front of the store, and the kids you know, right there and then at the store, put together their own, um, their own class, and then had each other judge it. And then they would put the items back on the store shelves when they were done. So again, you can get as creative as you want and trying to get the kids to actually think about, you know, like, how do I evaluate how I shop? You know, what are what are the most important things? Um, the money always comes to the top two. And this is one of those pieces that you will notice if we ever have money in, it comes very high to the top, because if they don't have enough money, they cannot purchase um, that piece um, in real life. You know, they'd have to come up with some um, uh, some other resources and, and way to find that. Um, we It's pretty cut and dried in North Dakota as you come through it. I have seen other, if you look at other states and other ways to do it where there's, um, it's much broader. Um, I remember coaching a team one time and the kids were looking at the fact that he, he worked at a movie theater and he was buying his sister a um, birthday present. There was no cost in there at all. There was nothing listed, but cost was a, was a standard because, um, because he worked in a movie theater. He didn't have a whole lot of extra cash and he wasn't going to spend a hundred dollars on a pair of jeans for his sister. Probably didn't, you know, um, on how you would actually spend in real life. So they really kind of want to get you to think. So when we lay it out in a situation, it's pretty laid out. So the, like Vanessa says, those kids don't have to think too far into these things, they just have to evaluate what they have, what they're what they're given. Any other questions? This is great discussion. Yeah. And I guess I would say any of us on the committee, I think we'd be more than happy to have a discussion with anybody who is looking for some tips or ideas, or you want to change it up and do it differently. And you want to bounce it off somebody. Um, we're, we're happy to, to help out because we have a passion for consumer decision-making. <laughs> that's why we that's why we do it. So there's a question in the chat. Are they given grids at the contest or do they bring it with them? So are you talking Lynette at the County contest or state? So at state, they're only given scratch paper, blank scratch paper given that morning. So they, if they wanna use part of their 12 minutes to draw out the grid and draw out 
Um, there was the standards fill in the blank, they can, but they're not given, they're just given blank scratch paper at state and then county. I think it's up to each agent's discretion on how much material you provide them. Uh, Vanessa and Carrie talked about giving um, the grid to their beginners, which I think is a really great idea just to help them stay organized because it can get really overwhelming um, for those kiddos. So county contests, I'd say your discretion state, it's blank scratch paper. Yeah, and sometimes if I've had a new, a junior who's doing this for the first year, I might give them the grid just so that they, you know, feel more comfortable and confident about what they're doing. Especially now when the, when we, the kids really don't have to win their way onto a team. Anybody that wants to go to state can go. And so I'm not as concerned about giving somebody an, an edge per se. Uh, in the chat, this is a good question for both of you, depending on how you do things. Carolyn wants to know, can she recycle her old, um, um, where's the word, Caroline? Her placing cards, remember all the, so we do use the Scantron at state, um, mm -hmm. but we don't, I, I know I don't use the Scantron at the county level. Um, we practice with it to fill it out so that they know which way it is, but I still use the placing cards at my county level when I'm doing that or to at least show them um, some of those different options. But how about everybody else? Yeah, I still do use the placing cards at our contest in the, in the county. And then I, like I said, I only do practices and then the state contest. So I do practice with my kids with the Scantrons because that's another really overwhelming. There's a million bubbles to fill in. Do I fill in all of these numbers? And they don't even use the back half of the Scantron. So, but I, I, I would agree that if I, I hope to get a county contest out here, um, I would just use the placing cards too. They're really simple and a good way to get them started on filling things out. So Carol, in your discretion, keep half of them at least. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> When I practice with kids, I um, kind of isolate some of these skills. So one of the pieces is to decide, you know, how to place a class. So I have a bunch of grids made up with just the X's placed randomly around there. And then they need to come up with how would you place this class and it doesn't even matter what the standards are because all we're looking at is how to evaluate the placement of those x's mm -hmm. so that's one thing i'll isolate and they'll practice for that and then when we were using the placing cards and you could practice this with a scantron scantron um sheet too but um i would just i have a bunch of um arrangements of the numbers three one four two two one three four whatever a whole bunch and then they have to practice just marking their card the scantron the scantron sheet or their placing card you know was it a b c d etc and so it just isolates that and we just focus on that one skill um in isolation and then you know put them all together eventually too but it gives them lots of practice at each of those individual skills. Those are those are great tips, Cindy. Um, I too use the just show them different grids and how do you place it because a lot of times kids will get caught up in well this one has three you know this one meets three standards and this one only meets one, but the one that only had one standard met the top standard, so that one's still going to place over the other one, and so it gives you an opportunity to have those conversations and and having them see the grid. So that's a that's a great tip, and um, I too when I'm using the placing cards as we're getting ready to start the contest, I will ever have everybody look at their cards and I do like a quick little okay I'm placing the class one four three two, call out the letter that that is next to that placing so they quick look it up and call it out. And then I give them another one. So they get used to looking for those combinations on that card. Same kind of thing. Um, I noticed too, though, when we did this this last year at our county level, and we're putting everything together in a packet rather than sharing the items on the table, um, which I really liked, they had everything. But I did notice as I was walking through the room, my seniors were grabbing them from both the top and the bottom. So they weren't going in order. So um, some of those pieces, um, making sure that your kids know which 
group or situation you're working on, you know, I mean, they really have to look. And then I also will mix up, you know, like, you know, as they lay things down, how important it is to make sure that you're reading your top, that this is number one, this is number two, this is your number three, this is your number four um, in a certain situation, um, because those things do get moved around or they um, reread them differently. So like Vanessa said, again, you've either missed something or you've misread something. So it's, they can whip through things really quick sometimes, um, but just kind of taking the, just glancing at how they're doing things and correcting which way they, um, they go. Um, and again, uh, the practice part, you know, the, the more the hands-on that they have with it, the better they are. And it doesn't matter if it's the contest we're doing the, with the information we're doing now or later. Um, it's, it's the skills that you're learning. You can, you're listening to all the gals give these different um, tips and tricks as to how they're teaching these skills so that they know how to evaluate, they know how to pull out standards, they know how to um, compare and contrast. Um, and those type of pieces. I know Robin is is asking for that earlier um, piece with it. And, and sometimes it's just, you know, I mean, we are doing the best that we can. Um, we're all volunteers doing multiple things. In the past, they used to have it hired out and done. Um, so it was kind of completely taken off on somebody else's piece. Um, so it, it, it would be great that yes, if you have the, the specific scenarios, but um, there's lots of time for the kids to prep even in the in-between time coming into the state contest, I think, which is really the biggest thing that they concentrate on um, at the end. Uh, and, that, and that's just my opinion, but so. But I know that Holly has resources that we, she wanted to share with you too before our time yes. is out. Yes, mm -hmm. so we'll, um, thank you everyone for the great questions. Um, we are gonna move on to other resources portion. I'm going to attempt to put something else in the chat, we'll see if it works. I'm just putting the link to the website, there we go that we're mentioning here. So the State 4-H website, um, if you go to program and events, state contests and consumer decision-making, there is a wealth of information. We've talked about the CC616, that is like the CDM Bible. It's It lays out everything really, really well. It talks about groupthink. I think there's even a, a sample class written out in there and it talks about how things are scored if you don't remember what, what we talked about earlier. So that's a really, really great publication to use. Um, the other screenshot at the bottom of the screen is a Powtoon, a really awesome consumer decision-making video that's also on that website that you can check out to kind of help promote consumer decision-making. You can show it at the beginning of your orientation or like a whatever group presentation you have to get new kids interested. Um, when the study guides are available, um, they will be there. And they're also on Ag Info. There's some older options or older classes and things on on that site as well. So there's a lot of awesome links and videos that you can check out to kind of even kind of familiarize yourself even further than what we've talked about today. Did I miss anything, ladies? Hey, Holly, I would have a question. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't been to the state contest for a few years with kids. Mm -hmm. Does it explain anywhere how to use the Scanton? So um, what we do, we, the state 4-H office created these really big posters that have them on there. And then at the beginning of, before the kids get started, there are helpers in each room that explain how to fill those out. So that, that piece is kind of handled at the state contest. And then you can work with, I think that same poster is also on this website. There's a it's got red yeah. markings all over it that show this is what you fill out this part, ignore this part. So it's on the website and it's also gone through at the state contest, how to fill out a Scantron. Great question. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a sample, a sample that you can print off and, and show the kids. So they're, so that they can feel comfortable when they come to the state contest. Mm -hmm. I was going to say too, that Powtoon I think would be a great thing if you're, if you're um, kind of advertising, the beginning of consumer decision making in your county, you know, even sharing that with with clubs because they could easily play that during one of their club meetings and and uh, be able to answer some questions within their club. I love the videos they have on there. I think sometimes I'm a visual learner, so I like to you know like especially the reasons um, they they list our kids, you know, from North Dakota doing their own reasons at the state contest. So you get a chance to hear how they do it well, you know, the ones that um, 
have all that information in with those. They're putting the prices in, they're putting um, maybe your calories in or your whatever they were looking for in that situation. You hear that little bit extra so that if you don't know, you've got kind of examples that you can um, go by with that. And um, speaking of videos, there's also some really good group think videos on there at the, not this past state contest, but the last one we had in person, the group thinks were videoed on site while the kids were actually um, doing the contest. And those I believe have comments or annotations that say what the kids were doing well. So I know that really helped me to show my kids a video like that so they could really see how to form those good habits of working together from the get go. So that's another really good video option. Okay, there's a question in the chat. How much weight is given to saying one item versus, or item one versus the Wrangler jeans? Let's see. So in I mean, other I guess words, how important is it to, you know, how much weight is given to referencing them by their item number, one, two, three, four, versus by a description of the item, the Vikings t-shirt, the Adidas t-shirt, the Wrangler jeans. I, I would say that when I'm taking reasons, um, I like to hear if they can say both. Item one, the Wrangler jeans, they're probably going to get a little better score. And I, I encourage the kids I work with to, to continue to use the number because I think that also helps them to keep things straight in their mind because they have to give the numbers in the placing. But if they can add what that is that they're talking about, that's always going to be a, a, you know, a great addition to their reasons. But that's just my opinion. And the day the contest is held at the state fair is usually that Tuesday morning um, the, of the first full week, right? Megan, she's nodding her head. Yeah, it's Tuesday, July the 27th. I'll put that in the chat too. Perfect, thank you. Oh, and it runs on Central Standard Time, correct, Holly? Yes. Yes, so, it does. And it, it does start early, so just reminding you mountain time people that yes, so that that in case we do have, I think they, we've slipped and not put that in there once or twice and that does hurt the kids. Yep, thank you. Look at Megan's got it perfectly. So yes, keep your fingers crossed that we are able to have it at the state fair this year. That's the plan. And also remember that we are starting it a little bit earlier. We did make that change a couple of years ago so that kids can have an opportunity to have a break at lunch and eat because we know they need food for their brains so they can come back and do the group think. All right, well, I see we're right around 12 o'clock. So thank you ladies so much for providing this training. It was excellent. And so I really appreciate that. And we will definitely get this recording sent out to everybody so you can share it and use it in your trainings. So I'll just conclude. Is there any more questions for them today? Okay, well, thank you, Vanessa, Holly, and Carrie for this fantastic training this morning.